God, yep. Hey, Vince. Vince McMahon. You wouldn't have happened to have seen All Elite Wrestling Full Gear last night, right? You may have been putting on some house show in the middle of absolutely nowhere with an attendance of 2,000 people. But had you seen it, you would see how to properly construct a very good wrestling show that didn't have just one match that was good. Was it perfect? Of course not. But All Elite Wrestling Full Gear was what you would look for in a wrestling show and a show that you would show to someone that has not been a product or has not been a fan of the wrestling product yet. All Elite Wrestling Full Gear put on one of the most hardcore matches I've ever seen in my life. This show was great. Was it perfect? No. But this show was absolutely great. And you know what this is? This is your All Elite Wrestling Full Gear review. Full Gear has come. It has gone. It has concluded. And it was not a perfect night. But this show was fantastic. Full Gear gave you a mixed bag and a little bit of everything to put into their, um, into their show. And I thought that for the most part that uh, this show was, was great. There was so many different spots. There was heel turns. There was uh, phenomenal matches. I mean, the Omega and Moxley match to, to close out the show was the right call. And the reason that I say that is because um, when you have... if Now, I want to say this. If Cody and Jericho had closed the show the way that it ended... I don't think the fans would be in favor of that, so I think AEW was a step ahead, and they said, let's have that match um, be second to last, and then have Omega and Moxley put on this wonderful, insane, brutal classic to end the show. That was what I give them props for. We're going to go over everything about AEW Full Gear. This show was great. I loved it. I was watching it with my friend, and uh, we had a good time, a couple of drinks, you know how it goes. Um... So kicking off the show was the Young Bucks taking on Santana and Ortiz, and I think a team like the Young Bucks, again, was a great team to energize the crowd and kick off the show. Match was a little bit slow moving in the beginning, but there was a lot of different things going on in this matchup that made it good. I think the tag teams, the tag team division as a whole is absolutely phenomenal in AEW. You have so many good tag teams, the Private Party, Lucha Bros, Dark Order, uh, Young Bucks, Santana Ortiz, you know, you just have so many different teams that are so great. Um, there was a ma there was a spot in this match where there was a Boston Crab uh, team move done by Ortiz and, Ars and uh, Santana. Then later on, there was an elbow drop from Matt Jackson mid match, uh, a diving stomp from Ortiz. Matt was going for a kick. He was running on the apron and going towards a kick, and he completely missed. And he kicked the ring post. And now he could have Jr. called this one great. He could have. Uh, he could have broken his shin, broken his foot, uh, leg even. Uh, and you could tell that Matt was selling that like a motherfucker um, throughout the, the match. Um, now, towards one point, Nick Jackson was thrown over the barricade right into the Rock and Roll Express, who were ringside for this match and for the show also. Um, this was fantastic. There was this about mid to late point in this matchup where uh, Nick did a uh, super kick to, uh, I believe it was Ortiz, and he sold it like crazy. He was like wobbling back and forth and then fell forward. It'd be something you have to look up, and I would, I would definitely suggest that you do so because it was hilarious. Um, Matt also did a double suplex to both Santana and Ortiz, rolled him over and did it again. Uh, Santana springboarded into a super kick. Nick was going... Uh, from the top rope to do a springboard, and his leg gave out, again, selling that leg injury. Now, there was a part in this match where Nick spit his gum at Santana. He picked it up, and then he chewed it, eat it uh, ate it, and spit it back out at him, showing how crazy he is. Matt gets thrown outside of the ring. Nick Jackson is in. Santana Ortiz hit the street sweeper and pinned Nick for the win. Sammy G comes out post-match, and he's vlogging with... Uh, He's vlogging, congratulating Santana and Ortiz on their tag team victory. Rock and Roll Express get a spot that looked very impressive in this match, uh, post-match, and they get in on the action. So they win the match, Santana and Ortiz, great finish, some cool spots in this match. Good match to kick off the show. Um, 
Another thing that I really like, um, I know WWE has it too, but AEW, some of the names of their finishers are so suiting to the character. Like Street Sweeper, you can tell that uh, a guy like, uh, or guys like Santana and Ortiz were, you know, New York raised, and uh, they come off evidently as Yankee fans, which is a plus. Um, and you can tell things like that. And then when they do, when they have the match with the Street Sweeper, you know when you talk about New York, you talk about the streets, and it's just, it just fits their character and, and their, their, their model of these New York Rebels um, so well. Um, the next match was Adam Pack, or eh, Adam Page versus Pack. Um, this match was a little bit back and forth. You got some good ending sequences to this match. There was a suicide dive out to Pac early. Um, Pac was in control mo most of the beginning of this match. Some hammers Page with kicks in the corner mid-match. He just keeps stomping and stomping and stomping. Pac went for the Black Arrow. Uh, I know they used to call it the Red Arrow in WWE. The Black Arrow, and he completely missed it. Uh, Adam Page got up, and he had a beautiful moonsault to um, Pac on the outside. Page hits a super kick after Flip and flips it into a power bomb. Pac put Page into the Brutalizer, uh, his finisher, well, his submission finisher in the ring, and it looked like um, he was about to fade. Uh, it looked like he was about to fade, and he did not fade. He was able to get to the ropes. Uh, Page begins to collapse, like I said, but he falls into the ropes. This was a good spot. Pac again went for the Black Arrow late. Missed it. Now, they both ran into the referee who didn't see it. And Pac was attempting a... This is the ending sequence. Pac was attempting a low blow. But Page caught it. He ended up turning Pac into the dead eye, which is his finisher to the win. And Adam Page beats Pac in a very good match. I wouldn't say it was phenomenal, but it was very good. It was entertaining. And I just have to, to put this out there that Adam Page hits one of the nicest moonsaults. I think in... All of professional wrestling, it is just absolutely beautiful to watch. Um, and that was pretty much where that went. And the next match was... Now, some people said that this was the sleeper match or the bathroom break match. I don't necessarily agree with that. Because the style of this match... The way that Sean Spears... This was Sean Spears taking on Joey Janela in the third match of the night. And the, the, um, the style of this match... I felt like it had... Uh, What's the best way to describe it? It was slow and methodical, and, and that was how the superstars were. So I don't think the match was bad. It just wasn't the spot fest that some of these matches have. Been. Controlling Joey Janela most of the match in here, um, there was a, a really nice spot in this match where he tied, uh, he was tying Janela's hair into the turnbuckle and um, speared him also using uh, Dirty Tactics. And there was a spear. Uh, this was this was really cool. This was a part. Uh, this match is kind of quick to review. This was on the outside. Uh, you've seen uh, Sean Spears execute a spike power drop, and he had he was holding Janelle upside down, and uh, Tony Richardson or Tony Blanchard. I'm sorry, Tony Blanchard jumped from the top of the uh, steps. For those that don't dive into the ring, the steps that walk up to the ring, and he pushed down on his legs. And uh, that was a nice spot to watch. He threw Janelle into the ring, and Sean Spears hit his C4 finisher for the win. Sean Spears won this match. He was controlled most of this match. And this is kind of what I had expected from this matchup. Um, I did enjoy this match, despite people say Sean Spears has been used beautifully on AEW. Uh, just his character as a whole and just the way he is. He, was, he has done more in AEW in five weeks than he has ever done in WWE. And that's so sad, because Ty Dillinger was one of my favorite characters. Backstage segment. And uh, this is one of the only backstage segments we got. Golden Boy was backstage with Kip Saban. And Penelope Ford comes in. And woof. In case I'm about Penelope Ford, bruh. Uh, she joined the segment. She kisses him. And they were, she was talking sensually towards him. And yada, yada, yada. So it looked like Kip Saban was, was not... Um, Kip Saban was not in action. But he was getting laid last night. Um, and that was that. So your next match, this was this was a match that I really thought had the chance to steal the show, and it was a good match, and I liked it a lot. It was the triple threat for the tag team titles. You had the Private Party, Lucha Bros, and SCU all going on. SCU uh, defending their uh, AEW tag team titles in this matchup. Lucha Bros, to me, are the best tag team in the world. Um, they might not be the most popular, but I think just as a team, the way they work, their in-ring work, 
the entertaining factor. I think the Lucha Bros are the best tag team in the world. It's just me. Uh, Lucha Bros did a beautiful drop kick to the Private Party. Private Party does some amazing drop kicks, by the way. I have to completely acknowledge that. Uh, Monkey flipped to Cannonball Senton to Private Party. Pentagon knocked by Crazy Drop Kick. Uh, SCU takes control as this match continues to go on. Witch takes outside dive. Isaiah Cassidy does a rope helo where he spins like crazy, knocks him down. Ray Phoenix does a package to the outside. Crazy move. Uh, Frankie Kazarian jumped in to a tornado, tornado DDT. Mark Quinn executed a beautiful star press. Uh, the SCU sets up a CU later and they execute it for the pin. SCU retains. Uh, this was a good match. Again, some of these notes are hard to follow because you're not seeing it. But if you if you see the way it's written, you see the spots. So you see how uh, different things can, you know, different things would, would make sense here. Um, SCU retains the title. Uh, and now this is this is another part. After the match, the lights go out. Pentagon is standing in the ring. He's standing across from a identical Pentagon. And everyone's wondering, who the hell is it? Um, Phoenix enters the ring, and he gets hit from that identical Pentagon with the Fallen Angel. So I think at that point, we kind of knew who this was. Uh, the alternate alternate, uh, alternate Pentagon takes off his mask. It's Christopher Daniels returning. One of the things that I didn't think really made sense is that everyone was going crazy. Like, Christopher Daniels was out for eight months. It's great, it's cool, but he was out for three weeks. So it's like, you know what I mean? How much of a exciting return could you really possibly make after three weeks? But nonetheless, I thought that this was uh, really cool. Again, you love to see Christopher Daniels. And uh, I thought that this was a great move, uh, having this after the match. So again, this is you're showing how you're seeing how this show is, is, is uh, giving a little bit of everything. Um, this match coming up was for the women's title, and I think that a lot of people, I wouldn't say they shit on this match, but it was just not their type of match. It was Rio defending her women's title against Emi Sakura, who was her trainer, obviously. Um, Emi Sakura had a rolling surfboard locked in to Rio. It was rolling around mid-match. Rio hit a nice crossbody. Vader stomp at the senton. Rio rolls Emi over and stomps again. Hits with Northern Light Suplex. Rio was utilizing a lot of foot stomps in this match against her. Um, a foot stomp from the top rope. Emmy powers out of the um, move. Rio counters a knee strike. Then she has a knee strike to the head. Uh, Rio reversed a lot of this. She was the, the craziest part about this is that um, there were a lot of reversals. And Rio is so small, and she's such a small girl where she could just a small woman where she could just um, roll around a little bit of everywhere. And and she was she was rolling around, missing a lot. They were there was a lot of Roll, there was a lot of rolling up in this match, and I don't mean weed. Um, there was a lot of roll-up pins, and it was reversing everything. There was a crucifix into a roll-up at the end, and it saw Rio getting that roll-up win uh, over Emi Sakura, and she retains her women's title. Again, what you think of Rio is up to you. I think Emi Sakura has been okay. I think both of them have been built well, but as far as everything else goes, it's kind of a little bit of hit or miss. It's time to talk about the co-main event. There are two main events, and... Uh, we're doing pretty well on time, but this, there's a lot going on. These next two matches, there are a shit ton of notes that I took. Um, Cody Rhodes versus Chris Jericho for the AEW World title. Again, I spoke about this earlier in the video. I think that this was, yeah, this was the right thing to do by having this match co-main event and not main event. Again, little things like that WWE does not think about. There were three judges in this match. Had it gone the distance, Arn Anderson, Dean Malenko, and the Great Muda. Back and forth match early. Uh, Cody did a suicide dive outside to Chris Jericho, uh, the missile drop kick from the rope. Cody goes for a suicide dive. Now, this was this was uh, a little bit earlier in the match. This was real blood, if you ask me. Um, the reason I say this is because this was brutal. Now, the way that AEW has their ramp set up, it is set up for the point of uh, just how the ramp is. It's up more, and it leads literally to the ring, so there's no ring steps, really. Um, and, and you would understand if you've seen it, but you know how those, those, some of the, uh, stage ramps are set up. So Chris Jericho, uh, or, uh, uh, sorry, Cody Rhodes goes for a suicide dive. Jericho slides it away. Cody's body at this point is like this. This is his face, and it smashes right into that steel. And quickly, and surely, Cody was busted open in this match. Uh, Jake Hager was also sitting ringside. He hits Cody when the ref does not see it. 
Of course, you knew that the Inner Circle was going to have some type of factor into this match. Jericho is in full control at this point. He's completely owning Cody. Uh, there's a point outside where Chris Jericho goes, and Cody's mom slaps him. Cody's mom and grandfather was ringside as well for this matchup. Slaps Chris Jericho. Jericho begins to grab the collar of Cody's grandfather. Cody then tackles Chris uh, as, he, as he notices this. And uh, Cody's starting to take a little bit of control of this match. Jake Hager did get ejected from ringside at this point. And uh, as that happens, you know, MJF was also ringside supporting Cody. MJF waves goodbye, how you doing? And Jake Hager completely annihilates the shit out of MJF. The ref is distracted. And while this is happening, Chris Jericho nails Cody with the belt and falls immediately. Uh, at this point, both wrestlers were purely exhausted. You could tell this. Uh, he fell immediately. Jericho kicked out of Crossroads. He thought that there was a legitimate chance that um, Cody Rhodes could win the title after this move. And then, right again, boom, Judas Effect from uh, Cody Rhodes and, no, Judas Effect from Chris Jericho and Cody Rhodes kicks out. And then, this is where it got a little bit difficult uh, for Cody Rhodes. Jericho put in the walls of Jericho onto uh, Cody Rhodes, and one of the things that you noticed was uh, Cody was, was, was clawing to get to the rope. He got to the rope. Um, Jericho was getting in the ref's face, uh, it was a female ref saying, you know, do your job better, do your job, and then Chris Jericho locks in the walls of Jericho again, and, uh, he, be he begins while doing this to stomp on Cody's head, so it shows you how much Chris Jericho really wanted to win and retain this title, it was also his birthday by the way, he begins stomping on his head. And then he cranks it back even further. So the way that this looked, it looked like his legs were literally going to snap off. And at that point, this is where the match came to a conclusion. MJF threw the towel in. Um, and they called it. And they said that Chris Jericho had retained the AEW world title. Um, as you can see afterwards, Cody was disappointed with MJF for calling the match. Because Cody never officially lost this match. It was MJF that had told him that... Um, on it so cody's disappointed mjf's here and i just had a feeling i think we all saw this coming when when mjf was on his knees begging cody helps him up that mjf was going to turn heel and what did i say mjf turns heel he low blows cody um like a complete jackass and then as leaving uh walking up the ramp there's a fan that throws water at him so this fan most likely did not see the main event because of something stupid, and they missed the best match of the night. So Chris Jericho retains after MJF throws the towel, MJF gets heel. We'll see where that goes. It's exciting to see what's going to happen on Dynamite, but that is what we have from that. So that was that match. The main event of the evening was absolutely insane. Insane. It was a lights-out match um, between Kenny Omega and John Moxley. This match was absolutely phenomenal, and it I'm going to speak ahead of my time and say that this is one of the most hardcore matches I've ever seen in my entire life. This was insane. If there's any match that you want to go back and watch, this is the one you need to do. It was a roughly 45 minutes long of pure hell and brutal annihilation on both ends. So they get at it early. Trash cans and all. Omega hits a drop, uh, drop kick. This was really cool. Outside of the ring, he did a drop kick where he jumped over the barricade and dropped him. Diving foot stomp outside the ring onto Moxley. Moxley was utilizing the barbed wire bat, which came into play early. Omega then blasted Moxley with a trash can. Omega gets a table. He sets it up on the outside. And uh, Moxley gets hit with Omega's barbed wire bat multiple times in various different ways in this match. And then he takes the barbed wire mat, uh, bat, which was, was stationed on... Um, Moxley's back and stomps right on it. At this point, Moxley is bloodied with the bat and is getting abused completely by Omega. The bat multiple times in various different ways in this match. And then he takes the barbed wire mat, uh, bat, which was, was stationed on um, Moxley's back and stomps right on it. At this point, Moxley is bloodied with the bat and is getting abused completely by Omega. Flexed onto a table of mousetraps. They brought out a table full of mousetraps. This was absolutely brutal. And he was suplexed onto a table of mousetraps. Omega choked with chain. Um, Moxley brought out a chain. He started choking Omega with it. He put uh, a real chokehold to Omega. 
Um, he's, Omega used the trash can to smash him to escape from that move. Omega was using the rope to strangle hold and uh, the chain to strangle Moxley, who had his feet from the outside, and he was pulling it towards from the inside of the ring. Um, then we saw um, Moxley being stationed against that table. We saw a suicide dive from Kenny Omega, that table coming into play right through the table. Omega rips. Now, R Omega... Somebody, I actually thought of this. This could have potentially been from the glass table that uh, Moxie was DDT through. Omega uh, picks up a glass shard, and he cuts John's hands with it. Omega dumps a bunch of glass into the middle of the ring, and he uses a sit-out spine buster onto John, onto glass shards. Absolutely brutal. Omega drags John through the glass, then has a submission on him, and to escape the submission, showing you how bad Moxley wanted to win, John then dragged himself on his stomach through the glass to get to the rope, but there are no rope breaks, but he was using the ropes to get himself up. Omega then picks up glass shot again and continues to rub it against uh, Moxley. Moxley then did get some offense. He suplexed Omega onto the glass. Um, then Omega did hit the V-trigger to Moxley, who goes outside of the ring. Uh, they were on the ramp. Omega was using a screwdriver. You could see Omega was going to that psychotic place using a screwdriver on the ramp to get, um, to get, uh, Moxley down. Omega calls for the Bucks, and they need his help. They bring on a huge spine board. Now, this was the most insane part, probably, of the match. It was a huge springboard, or a huge board of barbed wire. Moxley suplexed Omega onto that barbed wire, and you could just tell this was unreal at this point. Um, once they recover from that, they're on the stage. There's a little stand-up of, like, the AEW logo onto, like, a little thing, and it, it's probably one of those plastic things. Omega hit his V-trigger, and they went flying right through that stand-up stage. Um, then they're back into the ring. John hits Dirty Deeds onto Glass Shards. Again, unbelievable on Omega. Somehow, some way, he kicks out. Uh, Moxley gets his back body dropped. Now, they take the apron, and they start stripping the ring. And uh, it's just wood at this point. Moxley gets back body dropped onto wood. Very painful. After he uh, mega rips the apron mint off. Then Moxley were able to execute uh, into the ring uh, DDT, and he would pin Omega for the win. Moxley was able to win this Lights Out DDT match, or Lights Out on Sanction match. This match is absolutely insane. I tried to describe it the best way I could. There is so much more in this match that you have to watch. It is just it is just a beautiful thing to watch. AEW's first pay-per-view since television weekly broadcast. I thought the show was fantastic. I didn't think it was perfect. JR just feels like he lost a step a little bit on commentary. Uh, the women, they really need to start elevating them because it's been really hard to care about the women's division. Tag team division has been fantastic. The show was great. I hope everybody enjoyed this review. This is one of my longer videos, but I had an absolute blast watching this show. I hope you did also. What's going to happen on Dynavite? My guess is as good as yours. Thanks for watching.